Pterosaur evolution seems to be a remarkably interesting field. This is mainly because after the initial total blank spot between the first hopping Lagerpetids and the first true pterosaurs, truly cavernous unknowns don't really exist. To clarify, as of the writing of this video, there are a ton of different groups known. In fact, there seems to be almost more variety in large group designations than in the dinosaurs. Ornithochiriforms, Istiodactyliforms, Loncodectids, Pteranodonts, Ashtarchomorphs, Tapajaromorphs, Sungoriptrids, Pterodactyloids, Anurignathids, Darwinopterans, Tenochasmatoids, and even more. It would be like if there were two or three more groups equivalent to ornithopods or theropods. So at this point, the gaps between groups are narrowing, but uh, you know, they still exist. For the longest time, pterosaurs were divided into two major groups, the pterodactyloids and the rampharynchoids. The pterodactyloids were these short-tailed, long-necked, long-snouted forms, while the rampharynchoids had long tails, short limbs, and short necks. Over the last half century or so, so many pterosaurs have been found that these simple classification bins no longer suffice. They still exist, of course, but they have been whittled down to include more narrowly defined animals. Yet, the transition between the two groups of animals had remained largely unknown. The late 2000s and early 2010s saw the discovery of a whole new group that bridged this gap, the Wukongopterids of the Greater Darwinoptera. Over time, it was found that the Darwinoptera, which includes a handful of taxa and the Wukongopteridae, and the pterodactyl lineage formed their own group. This group was named the Monofinestrata due to having one giant hole in the skull that combines the nose hole and the hole that usually goes before the eye socket. Anyways, most recent analyses have found that the tiny, short-skulled anurignathids belonged between the Darwinopterans and the pterodactyl lineage. However, there still seemed to be a gap between the mosaic of primitive and advanced features of the Darwinopterans and the pure advanced features of the pterodactyl grade pterosaurs of the rest of the Monofenestrata. Thanks to an adorable little fossil, that gap seems to have been filled. But before I get to that, let's take a brief trip back in time to ancient Germany. Germany, during the time of the late Jurassic, was a series of archipelagos in the warm tropical Tethys Sea. There were many lagoons that would become isolated from the open ocean. Water would evaporate, salt would have less room, salinity would rise. The isolation of these salty lagoons made it difficult for animals to live at certain levels of these lagoons, such as more oxygen deficient layers near the bottom. The low energy of these systems, the high salinity, low oxygen, and fine sediments near the bottom all joined forces to especially preserve dead animals particularly well. Deposits that came to be known as Lagerstätten. The most famous is the Solnhofen limestone, which is a collection of many limestone formations that outcrop across southeastern Germany. Some of them are from equivalent times, and others are only within a few million years of each other, but all represent a series of archipelagos throughout the region during the late Jurassic. The most famous of these formations is the Altmultal formation of Bavaria between Nuremberg and Munich. A less often discussed one of these is the early Painton formation, which is roughly of the same time as the Altmultal formation. Stone from the Solnhofen has been used for centuries, and fossils have been uncovered from the rock for likely just as long. These rock units are responsible for some of the largest concentrations and diversity of pterosaurs in the world, and have helped to document the evolutionary diversity and changes among the early pterosaurs. All the way back in 2011, during an excavation at the Rigel Limeworks Quarry near Painton, Bavaria, Petra Hahn and her husband Stefan were looking for fossils when Petra found the near-perfectly preserved skeleton of a small pterosaur. At some point in time, this specimen would end up in the collections of the Dinosaur Museum of Altmultal. It would also go on to be described as the patent proterodactyloid and appear in many papers about pterosaur evolution for the next decade or so but never receiving a formal scientific diagnosis. Well, that was until July of 2024 when Friedrich Spindler published a full description in Paleontologica Electronica. 
Spindler photographed the specimen under normal and UV light because Solnoff and fossils tend to fluoresce under UV thanks to a high concentration of phosphorus in the fossils. UV light will also often reveal super thin or delicate features that cannot be seen under normal light. The specimen DMA JP 2011 006 is pretty much the entire skeleton. There's no need for me to just list off the bones preserved here because there is pretty much every single one. In fact, the specimen also preserves mineralized soft tissues in the wing and trunk. With so much preserved and a full description of all the traits, Spindler named the animal Proterodactylus frankerlei. The pro part is in reference to its evolutionary placement and the species name honors Petra, whose maiden name was Frankerl. The Proterodactylus is so small because it was young when it died, though it's possible it was either a juvenile or subadult. Spindler suggests it was definitely at least on the older end of young, aka not a hatchling. Proof of its age is preserved in its bones, which have an in-between level of fusion. Cause you see, babies have less fused bones and adults have much more fused bones. Proterodactylus had some fused bones, some unfused bones, some robustness in the bones, plus large hand and feet bones, indicating it had matured a tiny bit after first hatching. Okay, but like seriously, how small? Let's bring in Mr. Man from Animal Planet's The Most Extreme to get an idea. The wee Proterodactylus had a skull of 9.3 centimeters, 3.7 inches, a wingspan of 55 centimeters or 22 inches, and may have been no longer than 25 centimeters or 10 inches. Thanks, Mr. Man. Aside from the beautiful preservation, this specimen of Proterodactylus is most interesting and important for the traits preserved in its anatomy. According to Spindler's words, the skull was moderately elongate and it was longer than the torso. The skull has the nasal opening and antorbital fenestrae fused together into one big hole, making it a member of the monofenestrata. It has 11 teeth in the upper jaw, 9 in the lower jaw. Those teeth were moderately long, conical in shape, and slightly curved backwards. The type of teeth that were good for snagging swift prey. They didn't seem super long and thin for creating a net to catch insects and weren't robust enough for being greatly adapted for snagging slippery water animals. But then again, it was still young. It has a short thin neck and short tail. Spindler didn't perform any phylogenetic analyses on this animal because it had been used in these sorts of evolutionary analyses many times over the last 10 years. Here are four trees that various workers have come up with since 2017. This one by Vito Vican Martil 2018 found a Proterodactylus to split right before Eocypterus splits from the pterodactyloid group. This one by Wang et al. 2017 and Zhang et al. 2020 placed it right outside of Pterodactylus itself. This one by Andres 2021 found it was a side branch to another branch that contains three groups. Lastly, this one by Dalla Vecchia 2022 found Proterodactylus to split off the tree before a split between a group of two critters and the Euterodactyloidea group. Though all of these arranged the little beastie in different positions, they all agree that Pterodactylus is not quite within the Pterodactyloid group, but is very closely tied to it. It's therefore a perfect transitional form between the Darwinopteran and Rampharyngoid type pterosaurs and the true pterodactyloids. Aside from its evolutionary spot, not much can be said of the pipsqueak. I can imagine it hopping around, snapping at little bugs as it tries to avoid being eaten by most other animals in the area at the time. The paint and formations archipelago was also home to Juravenator and Compsognathus. Though these theropods were small, they probably could have torn our Proterodactylus friend asunder with the ease. The Anchiornithid, Ostromia, and Archaeopteryx were here as well, probably going after the lizards Shonesmal and Leptosaurus. The turtles Yuri Sternum and Solnophia swam along the coasts, hassled by the giant marine croc Dacosaurus. Thanks to the preservational context of the rock unit, sharks, ray-finned fish, echinoids, crinoids, corals, and plants have also been discovered from this time and place. I sure hope an adult form is found one of these days. 
For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.